Hands down, the most frequently asked question that I get asked about Turo and car sharing and buying cars is how do I incorporate depreciation into my business model? How do I ensure that the cars that I buy aren't going to depreciate? What do I do if a car is in an accident or I need to sell it and I'm going to lose money on that vehicle? And how do I handle buying the right cars for my fleet overall? And so in this video, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than I normally do on my channel. And I'm going to be doing a deep dive into kind of the two biggest components that I think are absolutely crucial crucial to buying cars and being successful with Turo. I'm going to be talking about depreciation and how to buy cars at the bottom of their depreciation curve and what exactly that means. I'm going to be talking about buying cars below market value and how to go about doing this. And last but not least, I'm going to be talking about actual cash value or ACV and how this all ties into being successful on Turo. But before we dive into that, I know, I know you guys have heard enough of the car sharing masterclass the last couple of months with our last few sales that we've been doing, but this is our last sale of the year. We're currently running a new year sale and if you use the code new year 2024 you can get 150 dollars off your purchase of the car sharing masterclass the car sharing masterclass is a compilation of everything that i've learned and know about car sharing and it's seven hours worth of course content in the course you'll learn everything you need to know from how to buy cars how to determine which cars are the right ones to buy how to find below market value cars how to automate your fleet tackle communications with your guests how to manage your fleet not only from an operational standpoint but from an accounting one as well how to tackle things like maintenance repairs damage claims, how to profit off damage claims, as well as everything in between. When you join the Car Sharing Masterclass, you'll gain access to our private Discord where myself, my husband HP, and all of our students join to discuss all things car sharing. And you'll also have a direct line of communication with me personally so that I can help answer any of your questions that you may have. This is the last sale that we will be running until Black Friday of this year, so if you want to get the Car Sharing Masterclass at a discounted rate, now is the time to pull the trigger. Use the code New Year 2024 and you can find the link to the course down in the description below. Now, I bought a whiteboard specifically for this video, and this is a video that I'm excited to make because it revolves around a question, topic, a concern, an issue that so many people have in the world of car sharing. And whenever I say that this is something that I'm asked about on a daily basis, I'm not exaggerating. It's probably multiple times per day. It's been multiple times per day for years now. And it's just an issue that I think a lot of people don't know how to tackle, especially if you're someone who's new to buying cars and peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. Now, I normally script out all the videos that I do, but for the sake of trying to be as detailed as possible, I'm actually just going right off the cuff for this one. So I apologize if it is a little bit more disorganized and maybe a bit more jumbled than my normal videos, but we're gonna be not only diving into my computer, but I'm also gonna be going and writing on this whiteboard to express everything everything that I want to talk about to make it as easy to understand as possible. Now, whenever we talk about success on Turo, there's kind of two different sides of the coin that are very important. Of course, the managing of the actual business, that's crucial. You need to make sure that you're providing a good guest experience, you're cleaning your cars, you're maintaining your cars, you're keeping up with your accounting. That's kind of all of the operational side of things that really do, in a way, dictate whether or not you're successful. In fact, not even in a way, they do dictate how successful you are on Turo. But another key component is buying the right cars and more importantly, paying the right price for those cars. And the way that I feel about Turo and kind of the strategy of either joining Turo or exiting Turo is that it really does come down and kind of begin and end with how you buy your cars. Because theoretically, if you were to get kicked off Turo or if you had to quit Turo, that in and of itself isn't going to be a life-changing or life-altering thing. And for many people, it's just like, well, I gave it a try, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna move on. But where this can become a really big issue is if you don't buy the right cars, if you overpay for cars, if you buy cars that are depreciating really quickly, if you buy cars that you're underwater on, this is where you see people get into really dangerous scenarios where they now own cars that they have no way of paying for them. And with that in mind, I think that three of the most important components that you have to understand if you wanna not only have longevity on Turo, but if you wanna create yourself a safety net with Turo and car sharing, is to understand these three facets. The first one is ACV. This stands for actual cash value. This is the value that a car is worth at that point in time. There's a lot of misunderstanding with ACV because this oftentimes comes up in the context of Turo and car sharing, because if your car is totaled on Turo, Turo is going to pay you the ACV of that vehicle. And a lot of times I talk with newer Turo hosts 
that don't realize that whenever their car is totaled on Turo, that Turo doesn't pay the amount that you owe on the car or the amount that some random person is willing to pay for it or even the KBV. They pay the ACV. And one of the reasons why the ACV is so important is because this is something that's pretty much pulled from a database and it is very difficult to get the ACV to be higher than what they offer it. There are ways to negotiate off of this, but in general, you can really only negotiate a couple of thousands of dollars, if even, and it's not something that you're going to be able to sway five, ten thousand dollars if you're severely underwater on a car but if you use acv correctly you can actually use this as a tool to make more money not less and we're going to be talking about this throughout this video the second is market value understanding what a car is worth on the open market and then understanding what would be either fair market value or below market value is going to be extremely important for each individual car that you're looking to add to your fleet and again i'm going to go into more depth on this throughout this video and then the third and probably the most important is depreciation Anybody who owns a car, but especially anybody that owns a car for the sake of a business or for making money, this is something that you must understand. And truthfully, I think anyone who buys a car should have a basic understanding of depreciation, but especially if you're using a car to make money, you should absolutely understand what depreciation is, how it impacts a car's value, which cars have higher depreciation, which ones have lower, and how it affects an overall car in the context of Turo. It's important to note that from a tax perspective, depreciation is also taken into account with vehicles, but what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically depreciation in the context of the cash value of the car, not from a tax perspective. The first thing that I want to talk about is depreciation, more specifically the depreciation curve. So right here is roughly what the average depreciation curve for a vehicle looks like. Now, what this is showing is that as you purchase a car, so this actually axis right here, this is the value of the car, and then this right here is time. And so what this is showing is that as time goes on for a vehicle, the value is going to go down. And that value of that car is going to go down a lot faster in the early years. And so, for example, the first three years of a vehicle's life, so like this period of time, a car is going to lose anywhere between 20, 40, sometimes 60 percent of its value in that short two to three year period of time. Whereas like if this graph overall was, let's say, 10 to 12 years, the car is going to then lose the rest of that 40 percent or 50 percent, whatever the case is left. It's going to lose the rest of that during the additional nine or 10 year period of time. I talk a lot on my channel about buying cars at the lowest point of the depreciation curve. And what I mean by this is that you should be buying cars roughly right here, but you should absolutely in all instances be avoiding buying cars that are in this part of their depreciation curve. The reason is, is that if you buy a car, let's say in the first three years, wherever the car is most susceptible to depreciation, you're going to own that car. The car is gonna be put on Turo. It's gonna be accumulated miles, have door dings, wear and tear, all of those sorts of typical rental car things. And as a result, as you own that car, the car is going to lose a ton of value. And again, the value of the car or the value that the car loses is going to be dependent on the type of car as well as the conditions that the car is in upon purchase as well as upon whenever it's either totaled or you need to sell it. And the reason why it's so important to avoid buying cars in this section, this period of time, so when a car is like one to three years old, is because it's just going to lose a ton of value. And the problem is this loss that you're going to experience, it's going to almost be inevitable. It's not going to be realized until either the car is totaled or the car needs to be sold. Because the thing is, if you buy, let's say, a one to three year old car, for example, let's say like a Mercedes or a BMW, that car is being rented out on Turo and chances are it's probably getting rented out for a premium price point. Everything is fine and dandy while the car is getting rented out because it can make its car payment, it's covering maintenance and repairs, and you're making some money on top of all of it. But let's say, for example, that that car gets totaled or it needs to be sold because it runs into a maintenance issue or whatever reason you just don't want to own it anymore. You might have bought the car whenever it's value is right here, but whenever it's time to sell the car, the value might be right here. So that means all of this value, you're going to lose that. And it can become especially problematic if you're somebody who purchased a newer car for an above market value price. And this happened a lot in 2021 and 2022. And so a really great way to protect yourself from depreciation is either buying a car in like the middle of the depreciation curve right here, or what I do is buy at the end of the depreciation curve, which is right here. Whenever you do this, you can very realistically buy a car, rent the car in Ontario, make money on it, accumulate mileage, wear and tear on it, and then sell that car for either the same price that you bought it for or more. And because of the fact that whenever you get your car totaled on Turo, they pay an ACV, if you buy your car at the bottom of the depreciation curve, there's a good chance that Turo will also either pay you the same that you purchased the car for or more. And we're going to go into a little bit more depth into that whenever we talk about 
about fair and below market value prices. Over the years, I've purchased more cars than I can keep track of, and the cars that I've purchased at the lowest point in the depreciation curve, these are cars that I have not lost any money on during their point of purchase. I have purchased probably close to 40 or 50 vehicles over the years for my car sharing fleet, and I always prioritize to buy cars in this area of the depreciation curve that way, whenever I do need to sell them, or more commonly, they end up getting totaled, I actually end up making money. And it is very, very, very normal for me to buy a car, list it on Turo, have it accumulate miles, wear and tear, have it on Turo for three, four, or five years, and then the car end up getting totaled, and I don't lose any money on the car at all. So Turo pays me actually the same price, if not more, than what I originally paid whenever I purchased the vehicle. This provides an excellent safety net because it gives you an out in case something does go wrong. And that out doesn't necessarily always have to mean, you know, quitting Turo or getting rid of a car, but it does mean in the case that your car gets totaled by a guest. And in those instances that are completely out of your control, you want to be protected. So by buying cars that are newer and at the highest point in their depreciation curves, so like right here, you are putting yourself in a position to be susceptible to losing money if something happens to that car because of the fact that it has all of this value to lose. Whereas if you buy a car that's at the bottom of the depreciation curve, you either limit or in some cases prevent yourself from losing any money on that vehicle because it doesn't have very much value at all to lose. But of course, there's the question of, well, how do you know if a vehicle is at the bottom or at the top of its depreciation curve? And that's a great question, so I'll answer it. So one key component of a car that's at the bottom of its depreciation curve is gonna be a car that's older. Just in general, older cars are closer to their depreciation bottom than newer cars, but that doesn't mean that only old cars are gonna qualify for this line of thinking. So to really show you what buy below market value looks like an application, I pulled up Auto Tempest to show you some of the different vehicles that are listed for sale throughout the entire country. Now, full transparency, I don't typically use Auto Tempest. I typically use Facebook and cars.com to do a lot of my research. But for the sake of, you know, pulling as much data as possible throughout the entire country, Auto Tempest is a great way to do that because it pulls from all of the different, you know, car sellers, car retailers websites. I also filtered out based off of 2008 and 2016 models, just to kind of make the pool of vehicles that we're looking at a bit smaller. But whenever I say buying cars at the bottom of their depreciation curve, what I mean is that these cars don't have a lot more value to lose. And a really great example of this, and there's a depreciation bottom for nearly every car out there. At some point, most cars are going to stop losing value. The point in which they stop losing value is what varies from car to car. You can see here that if we scroll through, we can find a variety of different Mazdas in a variety of different years with a variety of different mileage. In fact, starting from the top, you can see that there's this 2012 Mazda 3, which has 166,000 miles and it's listed for $3,300. A 2010 with 121,000 miles listed for $3,350. A 2009 listed for $3,550 with 128,000 miles. A 2013 listed for 3,600 with 118,000 miles. If we continue to scroll, you can kind of continue to see the same. You can see these cars that have a variety of different year models. They have a lot of mileage and yet they are still kind of within that $35 to $4,000 price range. One of the kind of best and most extreme examples is this 2012 model, which has 283,000 miles and it's listed for four grand and it's considered to be a great deal. Looking at this information, I would come to the conclusion that for a Mazda 3 that would qualify for Turo, you would be looking at a $4,000 depreciation bottom, which means that whenever you purchase that car for Turo, of course, you'd want to make sure it qualifies for Turo from like a year model and mileage standpoint, but you would want to buy a car as close to that number as possible. And the great thing with a car like a Mazda is that you can actually find Turo eligible vehicles that are close to that $35 to $4,000 price point. In fact, last year, I purchased a 2011 Mazda 3 for $4,300 around there, and it had about 125,000 miles. So with this in mind, I can keep that car in Turo for a number of years. It could theoretically accumulate over 100,000 miles, and I would be able to sell that car in three, four, five years for the same price I bought it for. One of the textbook examples that I've used to show depreciation bottom has been a Lamborghini, and years ago, I made a video talking about this. Lamborghini Gallardos are my favorite car in the history of the automotive market, so I've spent a long time looking at them. And the depreciation bottom for a Lamborghini Gallardo is right around that $95,000 price point. Pre-COVID, it was actually closer to that $75,000, $80,000 price point. 
but it has gone up and it hasn't really gone back down since. But you can see that across these different Lamborghinis, though they are in the same year model, they are in quite a bit different mileage, especially whenever we're talking about exotics, and yet all of them are priced at 95 grand. Another great example is the Maserati Ghibli, and I like this example because I think it's just such an extreme one. Maserati Ghiblis were introduced in 2014, but they really started to like produce them more often in 2015. So most of the older ones that you'll find are 2015 model years. And you can see here that as we scroll through, kind of $14,000, $15,000 is where the depreciation really starts to stop. It really is like around 15 to 20 grand. And in these instances, you could get a Maserati, you could put a ton of mileage on it, and you could expect to sell that Maserati or have that Maserati be worth between 15 and maybe like 18 grand. For example, this 2014 has 82,000 miles and it's listed for 17. But this 2014, which has 101,000 miles, is listed for 16. This 2014 with 72, 15, 5. Now, of course, it goes without saying that I would not recommend buying a 2014 Maserati Ghibli with 100,000 miles on it. But what this really shows you is that one, depreciation bottom is a grade. It's like a range. You're not going to find a number and say, okay, this is the depreciation bottom and there is no way that the car is ever going to go below that. Instead, the way that you should view it is as long as you take into account that like at the end of this car's life with it in your possession, when it's been done on Turo, it has too many miles, it's starting to give you problems, it gets totaled. In a worst case scenario, this car is going to be worth probably around this amount. And you want to be able to make that purchase with that depreciation bottom in mind. Because for example, if you were to buy a 2014 Maserati Ghibli and you were to pay 30 grand for it, you would know that that purchase would be an absolutely horrendous purchase because theoretically that car might only be worth 15, 16, 17 grand a year from now, or in the case of the Maserati Ghibli, a couple of months from now. In the case of the Mazda, we've seen that the Mazda 3 depreciation bottom is four grand, and so you wouldn't want to buy a 2011 Mazda 3 for eight grand because you know that if you were to sell that car, you could potentially lose 50% of what you paid for it. So depreciation bottom is a range, and that's the way that you should view it. There's a high likelihood that you will not be able to buy a car at the absolute lowest point in the depreciation curve, where it will have no other risk of ever losing any value. But there is a good chance that you can buy a car at a range and it will kind of fluctuate within that range in different periods of time. And it's important for you to know and educate yourself on what the depreciation bottom range is for the vehicles that you're interested in buying. And this is where, again, you can buy a car, you can have that car for a number of years, and that car will never lose a significant or any amount of value, and thus it makes your ownership completely free. And remember that it's not always just a matter of buying at the bottom of the depreciation curve, but planning your purchase with depreciation in mind. I totally recognize that not everybody wants to buy 10-year-old cars for Turo, but if you're buying newer cars, you absolutely need to be paying attention to what the curve is for that vehicle. One of the reasons why I bought the Maserati Ghibli is because it had an extremely extreme depreciation curve, and I bought it really at the beginning of its depreciation bottom for that period of time. And in the case of the Maserati, I owned it for six months. It was in total, and I actually made money when it was totaled, so I was paid out more than what the car was actually worth. The same goes for the Lincoln Navigator L that I just purchased. It's a 2018. It depreciated extremely heavily in the first few years of its life, and now the depreciation has slowed significantly. Is it at the absolute bottom of its depreciation? Absolutely not. But it also will not be losing 10, 20, 30 percent of its value in the next year or two. So this is something that you want to be mindful of and you want to plan for. But then that brings us into the next topic that I want to talk about, which is the context of market value and ACV. Again, I remember I mentioned earlier in the video that ACV is actual cash value, and this is the value that your car will be value that if your car is in an accident or totaled on Turo. Now, market value could be defined as a number of different things, but the way that I define it is what is the price that you can reasonably expect to pay for that car? And sometimes this is KBB. Sometimes KBB can be very accurate with this. Sometimes it's just like what you see in the market. And you'll notice that as you buy more cars for Turo, determining market value will become a lot easier over time because you'll just be in the world of buying cars, looking at cars, analyzing prices so often that you'll know very quickly whether or not a car is above fair or below market value. But I would say this is the fair price that you could expect to pay for a car. And if you're new to buying cars and you don't know a whole lot about the market, I would gauge this by KBB and set the settings to good. So like on KBB, you can say what condition it is, put the car as good, and then put it in the mileage range that you're looking for. Because the reality is very few cars are excellent, so you don't want to be gauging the value of the car that you're looking to buy on the excellent valuation. And so whenever I look at cars online to purchase, I want to purchase them below market value. So basically, whatever I determine is the market value for that car, I want to be below that. Now, typically, my goal is to be anywhere between 10 and 20% below market value for a vehicle, but I have purchased vehicles that are just 5 maybe. 
4% below market value in some cases, but the goal is to typically be significantly below market value. The reason why this is very, very important goes into a little bit of what we just talked about with depreciation curve. You want to make sure that you are getting a discount on the cars that you're buying, but where it really is absolutely crucial is whenever it comes into play, with ACV. Now, I had mentioned earlier that ACV is what Turo pays their guests whenever a car is total. Now, buying below market value is important for a few different reasons. Number one, it's important for the sake of keeping yourself above water on your car loan. If you buy a car below market value, that means that if you need to sell that car, you can probably sell that car and be made whole on that car purchase, or at the very least, pay off the loan that's associated with the car that you buy. If you're buying a car for Turo, you never, ever, ever, ever ever want to buy above market value for the car. It just puts yourself in a really dangerous situation and you also don't want to be ever underwater on the car. So even if you were to theoretically have purchased a car for a good price and it was considered to be either fair or below market value, you want to put yourself in a position from a loan perspective to not be underwater. And that means you know, putting down a down payment, making sure that your interest rate isn't absurd. Those types of steps need to be taken to ensure that you are not underwater on a vehicle and that at the end of the day, you paid a fair market or I'm sorry, a below market value on the vehicle that you've purchased. That is at the end of the day, once everything is said and done, loans are paid for, T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and you have the car in your possession. So it comes into play whenever you're selling a car for that reason, but then it also comes into play with ACV, which we talked about earlier. ACV is actual cash value, and like I've mentioned a few times, this is what Turo will pay you out on if your car is totaled. Now, the really great thing is that if you judge the value of your cars based off of a good valuation from KBB, and you buy a car below that, you are gonna put yourself in a position to most likely make money whenever your car is totaled due to the fact that Turo will give it a higher ACV. So it'll give you a higher actual cash value. The reason is, is that if we go through and we look at KBB and we toggle through the different conditions that your car can be set at, Turo will typically use the excellent valuation. And to really kind of walk through how these different things play into each other and why it's so important to pay attention to ACV market value and fair market value, and to really exemplify how these play into each other in a real world example, an example in a situation that has played out with my own fleet dozens of times over the years is sort of something that I've written on the board. Now, these are just kind of simple numbers. Don't be married to these numbers because there is more nuance that needs to be taken into account. And there are, of course, different aspects to every equation. But let's say, for example, that you buy a car that had a fair market value of $10,000. This is a fair market value based off of a good KBB valuation, and it was 10 grand. You buy this car for below market value. And for easy numbers, let's say that you bought it for a 10% discount. You bought this car for nine grand. You have this car on Turo because you bought it at the lowest point in its depreciation curve. You have it on Turo for a year and a half. It accumulates you know, 10, 20, 30,000 miles, but because it's at the bottom of its depreciation curve, it doesn't lose any of its value. But then this car gets totaled and now you need to figure out how much that car is worth so that you can be paid out the value of the car. Well, Turo bases this off of ACV. Historically, and again, I'm basing this off of my experience working with Turo, which has been probably a dozen total loss claims over the last six years. And in general, Turo pays about three to 7% above the fair market value price of a car. So if you see in KBB that a car is valued at $10,000, Turo typically doesn't go below that. They typically, in fact, go above that. Every example that I've had of a total loss, this has been the case. I don't want to say that it's 100% fact because I don't want somebody you know, to go buy a car and then this not be the case for whatever reason and they blame me for it. But I will say that there is a high likelihood that Turo will pay you anywhere between three and seven percent above what the fair market value price is of that car so that means that in this situation again you buy the car for nine grand you have it for a number of years but because it's at the bottom of the depreciation curve whenever it's totaled it is still worth 10 grand so this car that you bought for nine it remains worth 10 grand but because Turo pays out three to seven percent above the fair market value, according to KBB, this is all based off of KBB values. So if, again, KBB values the car in good condition at 10 grand, Turo ACV is typically around three to seven percent above that. And so for easy numbers, we'll just use five percent. That means that Turo is going to value the car at ten thousand five hundred dollars. But because you purchased this car for nine thousand dollars, that means that you're gonna make a $1,500 profit. So again, you have the car on Turo for a number of years, it accumulates mileage, it gets wear and tear, but because you purchased the car at the right price, at the right time, the car was actually deemed worth more 
once it was totaled than it was at the point that you purchased it. Or I shouldn't say worth more, you got paid more than you originally paid for it. People tell me all the time that this isn't how it actually works, but I can tell you from experience. Again, I've been to Toronto since 2017. I currently have almost 30 cars. I've had probably close to 50 over the years, and I have had a dozen total losses, if not more, over my career on Turo. And I can tell you with certainty, this is how it's worked with my fleet. 100% this is how it works. Of course, the exact numbers might vary a little bit, but this is the general formula that I have seen play itself out time and time and time again. If you buy a car below market value at a bottom point in its depreciation curve, you will make money whenever that car gets totaled. It really is as simple as that. Now, truthfully, I could probably talk about this topic for hours on end because I think that the topic of buying cars, depreciation, below market value, fair market value, actual cash value, there's obviously a lot of nuance here and there's a lot of different ways to approach this. And I also understand that there are a lot of different types of cars that you can buy and a lot of ways that you can kind of adjust this approach to the cars that you want to purchase. The reality is you can apply this methodology to not only old economy cars like I do, but also newer cars as well. The important thing here is that if you are wanting to buy a car for Turo, to make sure that you take into account all of these facets. Understand depreciation and its role in a car's value and understand how time affects depreciation. Understand market value and how market value ranges depending on the vehicle. And then understand how Turo pays its hosts out whenever a car gets totaled. I fairly believe that if you understand and really embrace these three components and you keep these three components in mind whenever you buy cars, you will set yourself up for success whenever it comes to Turo. But you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I know that this was longer and different than I normally do, but this was just a topic that I get so many requests about, so I absolutely wanted to cover it. And remember that we do have our New Year's sale, which ends on January 21st. You can use the code New Year 2024 to get $150 off your purchase. And the link to the Car Sharing Masterclass will be down in the description below. Like always, if you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell and I will see you guys in the next video.